Welcome back to The Retro Programmer. I haven't done an episode on this channel in about four years now, but I recently realized that some of the stuff that I've been putting on my primary channel, C++ Weekly, really is much more appropriate to The Retro Programmer channel. So welcome again to what is likely to be one of the most complicated episodes that I've ever had to edit, because I am recording several different source material at once, and we're going to see what happens. Today we're going to talk about BCD. Now, this is bin binary coded decimal is what BCD stands for. And I hope that this is all visible. Now, all of the com early computers supported BCD in some form or another, at least most of them did. We know that the 6502 did, and the 8086, and all of the IBM Big Iron. Now, from the historical perspective, why did BCD exist? And it was mostly uh, to help deal with financial calculations, but I will demonstrate what it means uh, and before we go into why that is actually useful. So in normal binary, we've got, say, uh, let's talk about 8-bit. We've got eight places, one, two, three, four, eight places that we can hold digits. And this can have, uh, this is the ones place, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Now the end result is that a value with all ones can represent the number 255, and a value with all zeros represents the value zero, generally speaking. If you watched the episode about binary arithmetic on my other channel, then you will have noticed that this could also be a signed 8-bit integer, which would represent the values negative 128 to positive 127, but still 256 possible numbers all told. Now, if I wanted to represent the number, say, 42, in regular binary encoding here, as we would think of it, then why 42? Because it's the perfect number, of course. The answer to the life, universe, and everything. I'm gonna break out my eight bits again. And if I had 42, then that is going to have a one in the 32 digit place here, and then in the eight, and in the two, and the rest of these are zero. And this is going to equal the value 42. Now I know I got comments previously about uh, too much shadows and keeping my hands out of the way and that kind of thing with the last one, so I'm, I'm attempting to do that here. So that gives us the value 42. Now if I want to convert the value 42 to an ASCII representation because I want to display it on the screen, I have to do things here, right? Like what are my options? I can do a modulus with 10, so a divide by 10 and take the remainder. So if I did a divide by 10 and took the remainder, then I would have two. And then that is the first digit I need to print out. And then if I did another divide by 10, then I've got the four digit. And I can print two and four, and that's a very simplistic way of working with this. It doesn't um, generally work, but we're working with perhaps a couple of modulus operations, a couple of division operations, and there's many shortcuts and ways to do this, but that doesn't change the fact that we have to do something with the value, which brings us to BCD. Binary coded decimal is only going to store the values that were decimal representations in binary. That's why it's called binary coded decimal. So if I wanted to store 42 in BCD, I 
I would store literally the number four. and the number two. So that means now when I want to actually write this out to, to the screen, I can just take the first digit and add some offset to it, whatever my ASCII offset would be. So in ASCII, although this is not necessarily the character representations, code pages that were used on computers that used BCD predominantly, I can see that I have the value uh, zero in ASCII is represented by decimal 48. So I would take this value two plus 48, and I could just write that directly to screen memory. And then I would take the second value four plus 48, and I could write that directly to screen memory. So I get my 42. So this makes printing and displaying the numbers much faster, but of course there is a big waste here, which is why most systems support packed BCD. And in packed BCD, each 8-bit value has two 4-bit BCD numbers in it. So we would end up with something like this in packed BCD. 6502, that used it. Intel also, kind of, has support for BCD. And 6502, kind of, has support for BCD. And we need to talk about why this kind of. But before we move on, if we were to add, say, 37 to 42, in BCD. Let's see what that looks like. And I dropped my consistency with my values here. But that is 1110 and 3 is 1100. That's my break line there. So we know because we know how to add that this value would be 79. And I didn't create one with overflow, and I probably should have. But we can immediately see that we definitely have waste here, because each of these digits can hold 16 values, but we are limiting it to 10 possible values. So if I add this up, I can just do regular binary addition. for the most part. Now, if there's an overflow and this value now is greater, one of these values is greater than nine, then I have to then overflow and carry the bit over into the next number to get it added up. So the logic is a little bit more complicated here. So that is effectively what BCD is. Now, BCD did not just die. Uh, it's a very old format. It is still being used by some systems. In 1963 and 1964, according to Wikipedia here, we had BCD uh, used on punch cards. And now that makes a lot of sense, right? So instead of making the user have to know uh, what bits exactly they want to set, being able to set you know, characters that looked like characters to the user here on the punch card, that made more sense. So that's a usability thing uh, for the punch card and a little bit more human readable code in that case. So we can see that there's a clear advantage here to outputting things to the screen. And this is where the hook for this video comes into play, is R6502 would, had this ability. So if we look at the 6502 instruction set here, we notice that there's something called decimal mode. The decimal flag controls how the 6502 adds and subtracts. If set, arithmetic is carried out in packed binary coded decimal. That's what we were just demonstrating here. And this is a flag on the CPU. 
So we can see here the set decimal and clear decimal flags. So if we're on a 6502 and we want to be able to output, for example, the score of the game that we are currently playing up here in the corner of our screen, we've got the screen and the player is, you know, hopping along on their platformer. and we want to output the score over here, they have 123 points, we can actually store their points in BCD. And so then if they get a new point, then we can just do a quick set decimal and then an add instruction for however many points that they got to whatever memory location they wanted to, to do. So the add with carry is always going to implicitly add from the accumulator. So if we wanted to actually be very specific about this, we might do LDA, the memory address where the score is held. Let's just say it's going to be in the zero page at memory location 20, something like that. Load that into A. And then add with carry into the accumulator, the value, what their new score would be. And if we wanted to use an immediate value of say 10 points. So whatever was here plus 10. And then when we're done, we clear the decimal flag. So this actually makes this really simple to do, you know, score manipulation or whatever. Oh, uh, sorry, I need to then do a store A back into that memory location. This is the problem with writing an assembly language by hand. So we loaded the value, we added 10 to it, stored it back in. There's probably other more efficient ways of doing this, but it'll demonstrate the point here and then clear the decimal flag. Now we have at this memory location, this zero page uh, value here is the score that is stored in BCD. Now, whenever we want to, we can go back here, add our offset value here. And if we're on a Commodore 64, this is gonna be in Petski. Petski is very similar to ASCII, but not exactly the same. So we do still, let's see, if we wanted to convert this to Petski zero, then we need to add the value 30 hex, which is in fact 48. So this is where a lot of the uh, 6502, like the BBC Micro, the Commodore 64, would use the this ability with uh, the, com the 6502 to do BCD math so that they could make these conversions for writing numbers out to the screen much faster. And if you talk to anyone who's written a 6502 emulator or done anything with retro computers, that's the thing they say, oh yeah, I've used BCD before, but only in the case of writing values out to the screen. Now, I said the 6502 can kind of do this. Now, why kind of? The Nintendo Entertainment System used a 6502 processor, but it used one that wasn't 100% compatible. They had, in fact, were using the RICO 2A03 8-bit microprocessor with a 6502 core. It had this minor note here modified to disable the BCD mode, possibly to avoid an MOS MOS Technologies patent. I've heard uh, before that it was actually disabled to make room for the fact that the Rico 2A03 also had the programmable sound generator in it, but I don't know. I don't know if there's been any die teardowns of this particular CPU. So the 6502 in the NES couldn't take advantage of this trick. They had to do other things to actually write their values out to the screen. They couldn't take the shortcut. Now, I also said that the Intel family processors have this feature, quote, kind of. The Intel BCD opcodes are six x86 instructions that operated with binary coded decimal. And there was also a part of the x87. Someday I'm going to do an episode on how floating point math worked 
pre-MMX days. And if you are young enough that you don't even know what MMX is, then there's a lot of history here to talk about. The 6502 couldn't do multiplication or division, but the 8086 could do multiplication and division, and it had packed and unpacked values. And note here, Wikipedia also points out that BCD was used for storing decimal numbers, especially in financial software. Now, note this note here. Unlike the integer-facing versions, the two instructions avail remain available in long mode. So the x87, the floating point unit, still has two BCD instructions available to it. But note that this is implying to us, and in fact other resources will show you, that we have lost BCD instructions in long mode on the 8086 family of processors. So we don't have support for it in the way that we currently use our Intel family processors. And at this further note on Wikipedia, in x86-64 computer architecture, long mode is the mode where a 64-bit operating system can access 64-bit instructions and registers. So still when your computer boots, it boots in 16-bit mode and then gets flipped into 64-bit mode. Well, maybe, yeah, it still does boot that way, I'm almost positive. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to boot DOS on a modern computer. And as soon as we switch over into 64-bit mode, then we lose access to our BCD instructions, which basically means for every modern operating system, we don't have access to these. So it's a, a relic of history, an interesting point, an interesting limitation of the NES, and was used in, I would say, interesting ways in games back in the 80s on computers that used processors that had BCD available to them random rambling episode here and a welcome back to the retro programmer. I hope you liked this episode and subscribe if you did.